Who's Zed? Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. Hey, what's up everyone? It's Ryan here from The Y, and today we're gonna be taking a look at Pulp Fiction. There is a reason this film is considered Tarantino's magnum opus. It's wholly original, the dialogue is some of the best you'll ever see, and the interconnected stories told out of chronological order are all equally as intriguing. Out of all his movies, it's also the one that leaves us with the most questions. Questions that emanate from the many puzzling decisions made throughout the film. Which brings us to what this video is all about. Examining the characters, their different motivations, and how it all impacts the events of the film. Following Vincent's final bathroom break, things quickly devolve into chaos. He's immediately killed. Butch and Marcellus cross paths at an intersection, and their skirmish eventually lands them in the basement from hell. No explanation is needed concerning what happens to Marcellus next. Though in a strange twist of fate, he's rescued by the very man he was just trying to kill. Nothing's ever outright stated, but I think we all assumed it was due to a case of that's a fate I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And while at first glance that sounds like a very logical conclusion, the following theory by Reddit user Kaiwa provides a more solid account that ties into everything we know about Butch. To put it simply, Butch doesn't strike me as the rescuing type. He's violent, cutthroat, and when asked by the taxi driver about how he feels knowing he killed a man. Now that I know he's dead, you wanna know how I feel about it? I feel the least bit bad about it. If he never laced up his gloves, which he never should have done in the first fucking place, he'd still be alive. Of course, this doesn't eliminate the possibility that some things go too far for even Butch to ignore. But for him to risk his life saving Marcellus of all people, who could have still killed him regardless, I'm convinced there has to be a deeper motivation behind his actions. In accordance with this, what's the one other time we see Butch get very emotional, act out of character, and make a decision he almost regrets? When he goes back to retrieve his gold watch in a move that nearly cost him his life. As you'd have it, both events, him going back for the watch and saving Marcellus' life, are connected to the saga of his forefathers relayed by Captain Coons. Oh man, I gave the watch to you. If you'll recall, Coons explained how the gold watch was purchased by his great-grandfather at an old general store in Tennessee, after which it was passed down to his grandfather, then his father, and finally to Coons prior to him dying in a Vietnamese POW camp. This brings us to the basement where Butch and Marcellus are being held captive. As you know, Butch manages to escape and is moments away from leaving when he turns back and the license plate on the wall gives a hint as to why he embarks on such a risky endeavor. Recall the story of the gold watch. It was bought in a little general store in Knoxville, Tennessee. Tennessee was where his great-grandfather made the purchase, in a general store similar to the pawn shop Butch now finds himself in. Furthermore, the basement is symbolic of the Hanoi Pit of Hell. We were in that Hanoi Pit of Hell together. And as such, Marcellus represents his father and Butch, Captain Coons. This metaphor is further supported by the events leading up to the basement, as the reveille can be heard in the background. With tropical plants in the apartment complex, it's all a figure of speech representative of him getting drafted and being shipped off to Vietnam. Hopefully. You'll never have to experience this yourself. Even Zed, a uniformed security guard, can be seen as one of the prison guards who tortured his father. And don't forget about the sacrifice both men made. I hid this uncomfortable hunk of metal up my ass two years. Not by choice, Marcellus makes a similar yet oh so different sacrifice. But still, ultimately providing Butch the opportunity to escape. So in my opinion, this 100% was the meaning behind the scene. He didn't do it because of a moral compass or fear of regret or anything normal like that. It was out of duty and in a way, saving the metaphorical representation of his own father. As Captain Coon stated, You take on certain responsibilities of the other. Butch had a duty, just like Coons and Wanaki, to see his fellow man he went through hell with out of that situation. Lastly, why do you think he picked out a samurai sword out of all the weapons? Other than looking badass, the Bushido code of honor and duty are very congruent with Butch's overall persona. Vincent Vega has to be in the running for worst hitman of all time, and it's honestly hard to believe he still has a job. Even before the film takes place, Vincent was stationed in Amsterdam, and knowing what we know, I find it highly unlikely he was placed there due to his good behavior. 
he comes back to America and within a period of only three days, nearly kills everyone around him. A lot of this has to do with his addiction to heroin, though that's a pretty terrible excuse. As a result of his carelessness, he nearly kills the boss's wife and accidentally shoots Marvin in the face. More on that later. After taking very little responsibility for creating such a massive problem, Vincent has the nerve to mouth off to the wolf. Boys get to work. Please would be nice. And later makes an enemy in Butch for no apparent reason. You looking at something, friend? Being my friend, Paluka. Finally, he makes one mistake too many by leaving the gun on the counter and pays with his life. As I said earlier, the real question is, why the hell does Vincent still have a job? And this theory by user Just Embarrassing proposes that while he's a hitman by name, Marcellus only really gives him menial assignments due to a lack of trust. His first and most important job is to accompany Jules in recovering the briefcase. But looking back, he wasn't needed at all. Jules is a very capable hitman, and it's not like Vincent really brought anything to the table like actually checking the bathroom. In the end, all he does is open the briefcase and kill Marvin. Vincent's next task is to take Marcellus' wife out to dinner. I don't know if you can even call that a job. It's basically make sure she's safe and don't f her. Yet somehow, Vincent struggles with both of them. You see, this is a moral test of oneself. This f***ed up bitch is Marcellus Wallace's wife. Do you know who Marcellus Wallace is? And lastly, Vincent is told to stake out Butch's apartment in case he returns. Again, it's hard to classify this as a job, as what are the odds he actually returns with everything packed up? And why is Marcellus there as well? In my view, the two of them were catching up as friends, or he possibly doesn't trust Vincent enough to do the job alone. Maybe both are true. This is all to say Marcellus is aware that Vincent is not a capable hitman, with the proof being the assignments he's given. Assuming that's the case, then why give him a job at all? Well, from what we're shown, Marcellus does have a degree of affection for Vincent, as he greets him like an old friend, lets him take his wife out, and presumably use the stakeout as an opportunity to catch up and chat about Amsterdam. It comes down to one of three things. One, they're just honest to God really good friends and Marcellus can't bring himself to let him go. Two, Vincent being in Amsterdam was actually him laying low, taking the fall from Marcellus and not ratting him out, which is now being repaid upon his return to America, although with low stake jobs. Or three, as Vic Vega is Vincent's brother, he's in fact highly connected in the crime world and is able to get and keep jobs he probably shouldn't have otherwise. Out of all his f**k-ups, shooting Marvin in the face has got to be Vincent's most egregious mistake. There's just so many things wrong with this picture, all of which we'll go over later. But maybe the most perplexing aspect is his utter indifference to what just occurred. Oh man, I shot Marvin in the face. What? Now here's an interesting thought posted by Tecla underscore SAP. Although Vincent adamantly repeats it was an accident. Well, I didn't mean to do it was an accident. Oh man, I see some crazy ass sh in my time, but this Chill out, man. What if he killed Marvin on purpose? There's two primary reasons I now accept this as canon, and I actually think it's possible that both may have played a factor in his decision. To understand Vincent's first motive, let's go back to the previous scene where we're introduced to Marvin. Notably, Marvin was shown to be Jules' informant, who Vincent had never met before. How many up there? Three or four. Let's count that guy. Fast forward to the quote unquote miracle, Vincent immediately becomes suspicious as to why he didn't say a peep about the guy hiding in the bathroom. Why the f didn't you tell us somebody was in the bathroom? Slip your mind? Before he can answer, Jules interrupts with the whole divine intervention thing and shifts the focus away from Marvin. The thing is, even though Jules might have been infatuated with this concept of divine intervention, I think Vincent never got over the notion that Marvin was possibly a traitor. He was a complete stranger. We know how Vincent treats people he's unfamiliar with. Being my friend, Paluka. And realistically, he probably should have mentioned the guy in the bathroom. Thus, it's not out of the question that Vincent killed Marvin suspecting he was some sort of a double agent. The next line of reasoning I find compelling has to do with the whole concept surrounding divine intervention, the shepherd, and the tyranny of evil men. Jules wholeheartedly believes that the missed bullets were a miracle from God, while Vincent thinks much less of the event. What happened here was a miracle, and I want you to fucking acknowledge it. All right, it was a miracle. 
The argument continues in the car, with neither side giving an inch, when Vincent decides to ask Marvin his opinion. Well, you gotta have an opinion. I mean, do you think that God came down from heaven and stopped- oh! It's pretty ironic that Vincent shooting Marvin in a way furthers his position. That shit happens, God is not real, and the supposed miracle back at the apartment was really just a freak occurrence. You might be thinking, so what, Vincent killed him just to prove a point? Well, harking back to my previous contention that he suspected Marvin was a double agent, maybe he made a spur of the moment decision to kill two birds with one stone, consequences be damned. It's obviously not the most intelligent way to go about handling things. But then again, we're talking about Vincent here. It's also possible that his addiction to heroin clouded his judgment and made him impulsive. And don't forget, he's the brother of Vic Vega, a man known for his wild psychotic behavior that puts everyone around him at risk. Vincent isn't exactly portrayed in the same way, but there's a couple hints that he's not too far off. I got a threshold, Jules. I got a threshold for the abuse that I will take. Now, I'm right now, I'm a fucking race car, right? And you got me in a red. And while I've explained ad nauseum how Vincent is definitely incompetent, for him to point the gun directly at Marvin's face, have his finger on the trigger, and pull said trigger, for all that to be totally unintentional is a step too far. Just look at every other time Vincent handles the gun. He's no picture of safety, but when he points it at someone, he intends to kill them. And I understand he's an assassin who's killed God knows how many people. But as I said earlier, to act so nonchalant and unperturbed, especially compared to Jules, it's very suspect. Chill out, man. I told you it was an ex. You probably... He went over a bump or something. Hey, the hit no motherfucking bump. Lastly, from a symbolic point of view, this whole theory fits in quite nicely. Jules is the shepherd, Vincent the tyranny of evil, and Marvin the weak. Vincent, as the tyranny of evil, attempts to sway Jules the Shepherd away from good, away from believing in miracles, and does so by creating his own bizarre event to discredit the one that is witnessed. Obviously, the attack by the tyranny of evil to dissuade the Shepherd fails to shake him from the path of righteousness. About the miracle we witnessed. Miracle you witnessed. I witnessed a freak occurrence. As even after all that, Jules holds steadfast in his newfound belief and takes a huge step in proving that by letting Pumpkin and Honey Bunny go. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, sorry for all the blurring throughout the video, but YouTube demonetized and age gated my last video for Blood and a couple other ones. So this time I figured I'd just take preemptive measures and blur out a lot of the bloody parts in Pulp Fiction which is a lot and it kind of sucks, but it is what it is. All right, till next time, have a great day, everyone.